Hey everyone, um, and welcome to, to this very exciting talk, in my opinion. Uh, I'm Kieran Hicks, uh, I'm a lecturer at the University of Lincoln, and hopefully, as you can see, I'm joined with uh, Dr. Chris Headland today as well, who's going to help me talk about juiciness a little bit and pose some interesting questions, I hope. Hopefully. Um, hopefully, yeah. Hopefully not too difficult. Yeah, hopefully easy questions. I could do with some nice, nice um, free throws, so to speak. Uh, and so, yeah, today um, I'm here to talk about uh, a game concept we call juiciness. Um, and I'm aware some of you probably haven't heard of the idea of making a game juicy. Um, or if you had, you might not quite know what we mean when we say juiciness in games. Um, and so that's kind of what this talk's going to basically go over. Um, and hopefully you'll find it interesting. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen uh, and hopefully you can see that. Um, and so this, uh, this talk's going to have lots of videos and we're going to kind of comment over lots of different games and what kind of makes them juicy. Uh, so it's, it's worth saying as well, if anyone's got any questions, like I said, I'm going to be throwing some, because I mean, juiciness isn't, you know, I'm a games designer, but I, I don't come from a, a juiciness kind of uh, domain. So uh, I, I'm pretty new to this stuff. So I'll be throwing some questions up. If anybody has any questions uh, watching the stream, uh, just throw them up as a comment and I will, I will be your avatar. I will ask them to Kieran for you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Welcome. All kinds of questions around juiciness. Like I said, it is a, a very uh, intangible and fluffy game design term. Uh, I'm hoping throughout this talk that you will gain a, a deeper understanding of what we mean when we say juiciness. Um, and again, if you if you have examples that you want to kind of give or maybe talk about, post them in the chat as well, right? Um, I think most people, once kind of they're exposed to juiciness, uh, start seeing it in all of the games they play. Um, and so it'd be great to kind of get that discussion going. Um, and so, yeah, before we properly kick off, um, I figured I'd just give a, a little bit about me um, and essentially what, what qualifies me to talk about juiciness. Um, and so, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I'm a lecturer at the University of Lincoln. Um, I sit under the InLab Research Group, where we do a lot of human-computer interaction research. Um, and in particular, a lot of my research is around um, games and play and the player experience. Um, if you're interested in player experience, there's a talk by me later on in the week on Thursday, I believe, um, where I'm going to be talking about what the player experience is and dissecting that. Um, so I might gloss over that topic today, but there's a, a proper talk about that later on. Um, and so uh, I have a, a PhD um, in computer science. Uh, and for my PhD, I actually looked explicitly at what juiciness is in games, um, how we can contextualize juiciness, but also... Um, the aspect I consider interesting is, is what juiciness does to a player when they're playing a game and how it changes the experience for them and ho ho hopefully, as I kind of found out, makes games better. Um, and so that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, and so I'm going to start off with kind of a, a dry academic definition of juiciness, um, simply because it's a nice way of introducing exactly what I, I mean when I say this. Um, and so this is a quote from me. Um, but I think it's important, actually, to kind of point out, while it's a quote from, from a paper I wrote, um, it's actually a uh, synthesis of lots of other game designers into one nice sentence. You don't need to apologize for citing yourself. <laughs> Feels well, good. It does feel good. But also, I'd like to point out, yeah, basically, this was, you know, we, like, spoke to lots of designers and asked them what they considered juiciness was. And the, the culmination of that was this quote here. Um, which is, yeah, so juiciness is a, a phenomenon that emerges from coherent design of game mechanics and visuals while providing confirmatory, explicit, and ambient feedback. Um, and I'm just going to break that down slightly because um, it's quite a scientific definition. Um, and so when we say coherent design of game mechanics and visuals, what we mean there is that when you're playing the game, it makes sense to you as a player, right? So, you know, when you roll a boulder down a hill in games like Zelda Breath of the Wild, the boulder has believable kind of physics. It rolls down the hill, and when it hits an enemy, it does damage because the boulder is a big, heavy object, and it hitting another object would cause an effect to happen, right? So the, the mechanics and the visuals uh, are working hand in hand together. Um, and that that makes you know that that helps make the game feel good and juicy. And then in addition, we have these three different things: confirmatory, explicit, and ambient. Um, and so what we mean when we say confirmatory feedback is basically, you know, when you press a button in a game, a reaction happens in the game as soon as possible. So if you think about a game like uh, Mario, when you press the jump button, Mario jumps almost instantaneously, right? The game reacts to that 
as quick as you know, physically possible, and you see that happen in the game. And that's confirming that you did, in fact, press the jump button. Um, and so that's definitely necessary for a game to feel good and for a game to feel juicy. Um, then we have explicit feedback. Um, and that is when the, the game, when you do something in the game, it very clearly tells you the thing that you did was good or bad. So again, to use kind of a, a visceral example, when you when you shoot, uh, you know, like a, a player in the head in kind of a game like Sniper, um, Sniper Elite, or in kind of games that like Call of Duty, um, the game gives you lots of feedback to say, yep, you, you killed the, the other player and you did it in a good way. Uh, and it gives you lots of feedback to say that that's exactly what you did. And you're not left um, wondering if what you did was the correct cause, you know, the correct action in the game. Uh, so it's explicit in telling you, yep, that's that's right. Are you going to jump in there, Chris? Yeah, with Mario as an example then. So I was thinking one of the, the nicest bits of feedback you get from Mario is you press the button, you see it jump, and then almost like a millisecond later, it triggers that, you know, that, that really nice, full, rich-sounding jump tone. Um, that, you know, you just recognize the load of that. That can only ever be the Mario jump turn. And, you know, I've seen kids literally sat with a Game Boy just pressing the button all the time because the, the <laughs> sound is, it's kind of visceral. Um, yeah. um, is, is, that all, is, is that the kind of feedback that you're talking about? So that is, um, it's, it's partly explicit feedback um, that you're kind of discussing there. Um, but it also kind of comes into uh, what we call, in, in the context of juiciness at least, uh, superfluous feedback. Um, and so, so what I mean when I say superfluous is uh, it's feedback that exists and it, it gives the player, you know, it says something's happened, um, but it isn't new information. So it's actually just extra feedback that doesn't convey a game mechanic meaning. Um, and so the, the jump in Mario is a perfect example of that. So, you know, when you press the button, Mario jumps. And so that's your confirmatory feedback. Um, but then the sound effect that happens, like if that didn't happen, you'd still know you jumped because you visually see it. But the fact that that sound effect does happen is a bit of superfluous feedback. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's one of the things we see in, in games that are considered juicy is lots of superfluous feedback. Um, and so I'm going to take, take the example of Mario a bit further because it's a great example of juiciness in games. Um, and so, yeah, in, in Mario, when you jump, uh, you get the visual effect of Mario jumping. Uh, you get the nice sound effect. Um, and then when Mario lands, um, there's like a dust cloud that appears as they land on the floor. Um, and again, that doesn't need to, to be there because you already know Mario's hit the floor because you've, you've seen Mario hit the floor. Um, but that dust cloud just you know, imparts a bit of believability to the game world, but also mm -hmm. adds another level of feedback saying, yep, you're on the floor now, there's the dust cloud. But there's, you know, we're saying it's superfluous though. I mean, there's, there's different ways you can jump in Mario. So if you if you jump into something negative, you get a, a sound. Uh, yeah, that's like a done. Yeah. yeah, or if you are knocking blocks, which sounds rude, but isn't. Uh, <laughs> if you're knocking blocks, um, you get that that slightly different tone um, yeah. from doing that. So it, it's um, it still kind of kind of gives you an idea of what Mario is doing at that moment in in the game. Yeah, definitely. And I think so. Uh, <laughs> to take the phrase, when you're knocking blocks in Mario, um, obviously you get that really satisfying uh, coin sound. Um, but that that in that case isn't superfluous; it's explicit because um, again, it's telling. <laughs> Chris is laughing at knocking blocks. Uh, is is telling the player that you have in fact, you know, you knocked the block and you you've got a, a coin. That's a good thing, and so it's making it explicit that that's a good thing with a nice high pitched uh, cha ching sound. Mm -hmm. um, and then just quickly, lastly, because I don't want to linger on this definition too too long, um, you have ambient feedback. Um, and what we say when, or, or what we mean when we say ambient feedback, isn't um, you know feedback that happens directly from a player action which is what the other two are, right? That's say cause and reaction. So the, the player presses something and the game reacts. But ambient feedback is more about the game uh, reacting to itself and conveying that information to the player. Um, and so one of my kind of favorite examples of this is Breath of the Wild, um, where there, it has like a day-night cycle. Um, and as that changes, the game's consistently providing different bits of feedback to the player to say that the, the time of day is changing and what that actually means uh, for the player, right? Um, and so at nighttime, as it gets closer to night, the sound music, you know, the, the sound effects change, the music changes, like the background uh, track um, becomes like a more uh, harrowing nighttime sound to make you aware that, okay, 
we're going into darkness and it's a bit more dangerous. And all that isn't happening because the player's pressing any buttons. It's happening because the game is reacting to itself because it's a mm-hmm. living, breathing world. Um, and that's, that's what we mean when we say ambient feedback. And loads of games have little bits of ambient feedback in. Um, and typically one of the things I like to do when I'm first playing a new game is actually, you know, just not have any hands on the controller and just seeing what the game is telling me when I'm not pressing any buttons. And so frequently you know, they have like nice little animation cycles or bits of the environment might be, you know, moving in the leaves. Um, but that ambient feedback again helps that world feel alive. Um, so that's that's the the scientific definition. Um, and so now I've got uh, one of my favorite GIFs ever. Um, and this is a, a GIF from the game Candy Crush Saga, um, a very, very popular game. I think most people have probably heard of it at this point. Um, it actually makes it a ton of money as well. It's, it's one of the most profitable games. Um, so it's definitely worth one of those things. It's worth looking at it uh, to see what it does right. Um, and I think from the angle of juiciness, this is one of the juiciest games that exists. Um, and I say that because for every single kind of player action in the game, it gives a ton of superfluous feedback, a ton of explicit feedback, and it just makes it feel really satisfying to play. And at its core, Candy Crush is basically just a, a match-free game, right? You match three things together, um, and that, that, that that's a good thing. They disappear, more more candy come down, and you keep matching free until you finish the level. And um, that's, that's a really simple mechanic that's existed for, you know, 30, 40 years. Um, but what Candy Crush does really well is it makes it very, very juicy. Um, as you can kind of see that in the GIF here, you know, when, when the player successfully matches, matches free uh, candies, um, there's a particle effect. It kind of the candy explodes and shatters in this satisfying way. Um, you see the score like jump up. If it's a combo, you see that kind of tasty pop up in the middle of the screen. Um, I don't have audio for this as well, but there's um, there's a really deep, meaty, bassy voice that just says tasty. Um, and that that in itself is really satisfying to hear. And that, that makes you want to keep playing it. Um, the the other thing that always kind of shocks me about Candy Crush Saga is that is that popular? Because, sorry. <laughs> Sneeze. <Zutai. laughs> right at the wrong point. Um, but the, the amount of feedback that is sending me at the moment from what was a single action, right, is yeah. just overwhelming. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at this at the moment thinking, <laughs> I, I've got no idea what just went on. <laughs> but it looks good, though. It feels good as well. When, when that's a, a reaction to your, your game events, and you know what's just happened, right? I think that's when it's it feels really rewarding because you're going, right, I just moved these two sweets, but now the game's telling me, wow, I'm I'm excellent. I've done all these gr- great things at once. Um, and that, that makes it satisfying to play. Mm. Yeah, great. Uh, so this is um, it's actually a, a still taken from a, a really excellent talk um, called Juice It or Lose It um, by Martin Johansson and Petri Prujo. Um, uh, it's available on YouTube, so I recommend going and watching it at some point because uh, they do a great breakdown of, of adding juice. Um, and one of the things they say is basically juice juiciness you know, can be seen as basically the maximum amount of output possible for the minimum output. Uh, sorry, for the minimum input. And so Chris has just highlighted this exactly, right? I don't know if he meant to do that, but he did it perfectly. And that in Candy Crush, you have a really small amount of input, like just a single swipe or a single click to move those sweets but then you get the maximum output possible from that action, right? You're being uh, told how good your, your action was on so many different layers at once, um, and that, that makes it juicy. Um, but so I think it's, it's important at this point just to take a quick break um, and kind of consider what juiciness adds, because it's, it's quite easy to see lots of uh, game developers saying, add juiciness to your game, it's going to make it great. Um, but it does a bit more than just make your game great, because um, that that can mean a whole host of different things. Um, so one of the things we've actually scientifically found um, through studies is that when you have juiciness in your game, the, the visual appeal increases. Um, that might seem like a no-brainer, but now we statistically know that's true. Um, and so that's really interesting, right, that through adding, adding some juiciness to your game, it makes the game look better, but also means that the players perceive it as a higher, uh, higher quality experience. Um, and that's interesting, particularly if you're making commercial games. If the player thinks what they're getting is a, a higher aesthetic polish and it's perceived the value of the game's perceived higher, well, that means you can p- potentially charge more for it or in, uh, players can feel like they're getting value for their money. 
Um, the other aspect of juiciness is it can actually help players uh, feel more confident in the game. And again, if we look at that Candy Crush Saga example, you know, from doing something right, you get told that you're doing excellent at the game and you're you're a great player. And that helps helps them feel more confident and that actually helps uh, foster what we call intrinsic motivation. Um, as a quick tangent, intrinsic motivation is basically uh, the type of motivation that you intrinsically feel. And what I mean when I say that is it's when you do something for the sake of doing something. Like typically when you play a game, no one's telling you to play a game uh, and you'll get X reward. Instead, you're playing a game because you want to play it for the sake of playing the game. That's an intrinsic motivation. Um, and so juiciness can actually help foster that, which is really interesting. So in this talk, um, kind of the way we've, we've broken the structure down is I've got a, <clears throat> a selection of industry games that are all fairly commercially successful. Uh, and we're just going to talk through some of the different juicy aspects in them, um, what makes them juicy, kind of the different elements they've applied and how that's actually rippled out to change the experience. Um, and then potentially the, the takeaway that I want everyone to kind of have from this that's at least interesting, uh, interested in bringing juiciness to their games is five tips that can be fairly easily included into your game to actually help make it begin to feel juicy. Um, that isn't to say that if you do these five tips, you instantly have a juicy game. It takes quite a lot of effort and time to make a game juicy. Um, but these tips are a good start. Sure. Um, so just, just back to, you know, when you were saying that about this, this idea of polish and yeah. how it makes people think they value the game more. I mean, that, that's, that feels to me like the kind of base, basic kind of product science, you know. If, you, um, if you're producing a high-value product um, or if you, you buy something that you want to perceive as high value, you, you expect a certain level of, of spit and polish, right? I mean, if... Um, if you, if you're buying um you know uh well anything like a camera and if, if the finish isn't quite right and the, the fascia doesn't perfectly fit if it doesn't make a nice i mean one of the things i really love about my slr is there's a really satisfying to tick noise yeah, when i press the shutter and it's not really doing anything that that's almost entirely simulated but it yeah. feels good and that because it feels good, that makes it a more pleasurable experience. Thus, you want to use it more. Um, and I think you know this this whole uh, perceived value thing. Um, we kind of um, we we mentioned it was similar to judging a book by its cover, right? So if a game's juicy, you basically are judging it on its visual appeal, and you're applying a kind of okay because it's because it looks this juicy. Uh, I think it must be a highly polished game. Thus, it's worth more money. Um, and I think that's really interesting. Um, I think a good a good side point is obviously when when you do kind of buy um, expensive goods like like at the uh, the camera and Chris example, or actually I'm going to use another example, which is the the chairs that both me and Chris happen to be sitting on at the moment. Um, like when when I bought that chair, it came in a really fancy packaging, and it had this big nice laminated card that felt really expensive. It wasn't even to do with the chair at all, mm. but that card, I went, wow, this is a nice polished. Uh, experience they've designed for me right they've crafted how i opened this box and i'm sure if you've seen youtube unboxings there's a similar kind of element going on there a little bit of a tangent but worth worth discussing I mean, it's, it's absolutely true right i mean like i say i mean this isn't a uh, an advert for secret lab but <laughs> when i opened the box it was all laid out really well and i mean even the i'm used to when you buy like a piece of flat pack furniture you get that little um Allen key that's um, in the uh, kind of ballista pack of bolts and everything yeah. else. Whereas this came for this tiny little toolkit, <laughs> and it was it was well presented. It was branded, and you know it was almost wow. I I felt like I was getting something extra. I've got a pile of old Allen keys, but this felt this was a good Allen key. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to hold on to this and put it in my toolbox. Um, it it felt like you know. Like I say, that there was just that extra bit of polish that I felt like I'm buy now bought a premium product. Yeah, and that's that's exactly what juiciness can add to a game, and I think is a is a good kind of um, thing to talk about. Is that all the games I'm going to kind of showcase in a minute? Um, they're all, like I said, fairly commercially successful. Um, and again, there's no direct evidence to say they're juicy. That's why they're successful. But there is an interesting thing when you look at the top selling games they all have what we'd consider very juicy elements throughout. Um, so there is definitely something there, I'd like to say at least. Um, so yeah, let's um, 
jump on to. So before we start looking at commercial examples, I actually just wanted to showcase a really good um, way of looking at juiciness. So here we have a breakout, or it's a, like a breakout clone. Um, and so hopefully most people are familiar with this game. You control the bat at the bottom and you hit the ball and you're just trying to destroy all of those uh, bricks. And so this this is basically how the game looked when it, when it originally released. Um, and it's not very juicy. Um, we're not getting any extra kind of superfluous feedback. Um, there is normally some sound for this one where it goes like beep boop as you hit each stuff. But that's it. Um, but if we kind of follow what we consider juiciness and add it to the exact same game, so mechanically nothing's changing here, um, and instead there's just lots of extra effects happening for all the different game actions, um, you can instantly see actually how add in a few particle effects, some some screen wobble makes makes the experience feel a bit more engaging. It's the exact same gameplay here. Nothing else has changed, right? It's still breakout, um, but those eyes at the bottom and the mouth, like that adds a lot to the experience. Did you make this one? No, no, I didn't make this one. Because uh, this badly. looks a lot like your graphic style, <laughs> right? Because you've, you've got a very specific design style and there, there was a an odor hicks uh, about it. It's, it's certainly something I would make, but no, this is actually... Um, a game taken from that juice it or lose it talk that I referenced oh, wow. um, a few minutes ago. They basically show showcase adding each of their elements to this game to, to you know illustrate what it adds. Um, but it's a great example. You know, if we look, if we go back to um, if we go back to this one. It feels really boring in comparison now, right? There's no feedback elements. It's just boring old breakout. And we go to the juicy one. It's like nice as breakout. And all that screen shake happens. And it's fun. Um, so yeah, if you're ever unsure of what juiciness is, this is the best example I can kind of provide easily of, of what it should look like when it's been applied. Uh, so there we go. So one of the games I wanted to talk about um, in terms of juiciness is Peggle. Um, so Peggle came out quite a while ago. Um, and it's made of PopCap games, um, but it's a a perfect example of what juiciness can add. Um, so it's sort of like the HBO title yeah. Oh. oh yeah, yeah. Actually, it does sound <laughs> a lot like that. Um, and so, like one of my favorite bits of juiciness they have in this game, and you can hear it right now, is um, the the like the ping each time you hit a, a peg with the ball. Um, the sound effect ascends slightly in pitch, and so the the more you hit in one ball, the higher that pitch gets. And there's something again visceral about hearing that and going, "Oh man, this feels like I just hit six pegs at once." Amazing. Um, and it feels, yeah, it just feels satisfying to do that. Um, and it's a relatively cheap thing to implement, right? To change the pitch of a sound effect for each combo. It doesn't take too much effort. Um, and then the next thing we're going to see, and this is where it comes to this idea of um, superfluous feedback, is when you finish the level, uh, you get all this loud music, the, the game sh like throws particle effects at you everywhere. There's my you know, ode to joy of all the songs. <laughs> yeah. that my own to joy like it hits all of you that yeah it hits um all of those different feedback elements at once and that makes it really overwhelming for the player but also very satisfying when that happens um and it's rewarding um and so that's you know it's a great example of a bit of juiciness there um i mean at its core it's a really simple game right i mean it's yeah. it's essentially um uh i can't remember a pachinko it, game yeah yeah, yeah exactly um, yeah, that, that's all it is. But through, again, very careful crafting of juiciness and making sure there's feedback for all those game elements, um, it makes it satisfying to play. It makes it just satisfying to throw a ball out and see what it hits um, and you know, hear those sound and see those feedback effects. Um, and so yeah, the next thing I want to kind of talk about is uh, Rocket League. Um, so Rocket League is a game I absolutely suck at. I know Chris plays it a little bit with uh, Ben. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm really bad at it. I'm present. Ben plays. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm really so bad probably at sim like yeah, similar experience to me then. Um, and the thing about Rocket League again is it wasn't the the first game um, to you know mix driving a car and having a football. Um, but what it did do really well is added lots of different juicy effects. Um, and so you can see right there when when the player is boosting, there's this nice particle effect that comes out the back of the car, and it looks kind of um, I don't know, it just looks satisfying to see those flames fly out. Um, and actually, yeah, the bit that 
and I just talked over is one of my favorite things in Rocket League. So when you when you score a goal, one, the ball disappears into that really nice uh, puff of particles. Um, but two, all of the cars get sh like shoved back physically and kind of um, it highlights how how important of a gameplay event that was. Like the players have scored and that's really big and you should know how important that is. And so it does that by basically stopping the game and pushing everyone back. But because it's using physics, it kind of feels quite satisfying when you do score and you feel that explosion, you get pushed back and the, the crowd cheers at the same time. Um, all those events kind of cascade into making it feel really satisfying. Mm. I'm not sure if Chris, you have anything to add as a Rocket League player. Like, is there anything you've particularly kind of picked up on? Yeah, I mean, there's there's lots of little things, actually. I mean, just like the timing of the, um, the auditory feedback when you hit the ball. Um, it, it's like not perfect it's just you know it's ever slightly delayed and you and it it feels quite nice um even picking up the boosts and, and that's sure that the boost animation sequence is is just um i'll say i wouldn't say screen shake but you you see that kind of the impact yeah, of I mean, have screen it for, for gameplay events like then when they uh, when the car got hit the screen shakes it's quite subtle um, it's one of those things that sometimes you might not necessarily notice it's happening until someone points it out to you and you go, yeah, the screen's shaking most of the time. Um, but I think you, you highlighted an interesting bit there with the ball um, is the ball has really meaty sound effects and mm -hmm. that they're, they're, they're quite bassy. And when you do hit it, it's like a solid clunk. So it doesn't feel like a, a light beach ball. It feels like a really heavy metal ball that has weight in the world. And again, it's just satisfying to hit it when you do. Um, it doesn't behave like a really heavy meta ball. It behaves more like a beach ball. Um, but the the sound effects give that illusion and again make it feel like it's got weight behind it. It, it gives you an idea of these aren't toy cars. This is this is these are big cars and this yeah. is a big event. And um, but no, it's it's a very well for for such a simple concept, which is essentially is it. You know, it's it's bumper cars of a beach ball. It's just very well constructed. Yeah. And so I think what's what's um, quite interesting is so uh, Cyanox, the people that make this game, um, this isn't even the first car football game they made. They made a previous game that was just the, the exact same, right? It was you had cars and you uh, hit a football around a small area to score goals. Um, but if you look at that game in, in hindsight, it has none of the juicy elements that Rocket League has. It doesn't have any of the meat sound effects. It doesn't have the kind of particle effects that are everywhere when, when um, the cars explode in Rocket League. It's missing all of that polish. Um, it's interesting that they ended up just remaking it with lots of polish, and it was really successful. Um, now, there's no way we can talk about juiciness without uh, looking at Mario um, as one of the kings of basically kind of that that aesthetic polish. Nintendo's really good at making every single possible gameplay event and, and gameplay action um, give that um, explicit feedback, give that ambient feedback, and that confirmatory feedback all at the same time. Um, they're absolutely masters of it. Um, and so here, when you can see, um, like Mario's running around in the moment, um, and depending on kind of the speed of Mario, uh, the, the particle effects, like the little smoke particle effects change. And so they start off not really appearing. And then once Mario's picked up speed, they start appearing quite fast. And then as he stops, they do like a little skid particle effect. Um, and all of that doesn't add anything to the game, right? That's not, that doesn't affect how you control Mario. Um, what it does do is it makes, it makes Mario feel like a real thing in that world. And it's, again, constantly informing you of the state of, of Mario's kind of um, avatar state, right? It's informing you what's happening in the game. Can I be mildly controversial, though? Oh, yeah, please. So, I, I personally, I think the, the the coherence of the feedback elements of the really old, you know, the, the original kind of uh, Game Boy style Mario is more satisfying than in the modern kind of 3D um because I don't know. I think because you're you're playing with less, those um, again. I, I think this is, this might be just me showing my age, and this might be <laughs> kind of similar to the Candy Crush example. There's so much going on here that for me the juiciness is almost distracting. Whereas mm -hmm. with um, the the kind of the old 2D Mario um, Super Mario Brothers and that, that, it was just it just polished. It just felt really. I, I still argue from from kind of a game design, game studies perspective. The original Super Mario is is one of the best games ever designed. 
Yep, I definitely agree with you that the original Super Mario Brothers is one of the best designed games ever. Um, and I think, like, I definitely kind of agree with what you're saying to some extent in that because it was a, a simpler game, they were able to really refine the elements that were you know, fed back to the player to not feel overwhelming. Um, and it's the case, you know, in Mario, like, I could point out the the multitude of different feedback elements that are happening in uh, Super Mario Odyssey. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can I can see how they could be overwhelming, but I do wonder if that's because we're currently observing, right? We're um, with the audience to this gameplay. And I think yeah. when, when you're playing it, I think a lot of those feedback elements um, kind of aren't consciously picked up on. Um, or at least that, that's my experience when I'm playing Mario. I'm not constantly looking at those particle effects. They're there, and I'm registering them maybe in my you know, subconscious, but I'm not going, oh, that particle effect's there. Mm. Um, so you suppose yeah. it's, it's just kind of, um, I, I mean, just to sort of treat this like a layman then, you're just adding additional communications channels to the game. You're just telling yeah, the player... That, that more- should be what juiciness is, right? Is It's just adding more superfluous information. It doesn't have any new information that the player has to interpret. It's just information that's there for the player to see. Um, and so uh, it's not in this clip, um, but Super Mario Odyssey has one of the, the best bits of, of juicy feedback I've ever seen, in my opinion, or at least as someone that analyzes it, um, it really impressed me when I saw it. Um, and so what that is, is um, if you listen, there's, there's like a, ba- a background soundtrack happening at the moment. Um, and so when you open up the like the menu interface for Mario, um, and as you move through each of the different interface, you know, like the different menu options between like quick game, save game, and all that kind of stuff. Um, typically, in most games and most interfaces you've probably ever used, there's normally like an audio bleep to kind of confirm that you've moved across the different interface uh, elements. But in Mario, what they do is they have that bleep, but the bleep is actually tuned to whatever key the background music is currently playing. Um, oh, wow. And so it's, it's so incredibly subtle. That I, I, I assume most players will never pick up on it. Um, but it's one of the things I noticed now. I was like, that, that's such a nice, like, juicy aspect because, it, again, each of the kind of game worlds in Mario has its own soundtrack. And so that then conveys into the menu to convey what's happening in the game. So um, one of our alumni, like um, George, is a, you know, a, a video games audio specialist. And um, I'm, I'm sure he can probably get a lot more. Um, insight on that side but it's true i mean you do play some games especially the ones that have stock audio and you know you'll get say character actions in the key of e and background music in the key of a and it clashes and it does sound it sounds jarring to your ears exactly um and yeah it's not like i think again most people probably wouldn't notice it but to me that's one of the juiciest aspects they have in that game um and yeah, I think most most of the Mario games are, are great examples to kind of analyze and see, um, you know, if you're interested in kind of looking at juice in as far as, you know, press a button in Mario and just count all the different ways that the game is telling you what's happening. Because um, it's normally like in the, the realms of like five or six different feedback elements are happening, um, whether that's through the animations, through particle effects, through sound uh, elements, um, or through the actual physicality of Mario moving. Uh, but yeah, let's move on to the next one. Um, and so yeah, this is actually a bit more of an indie game. So we've looked at quite a lot of commercial, you know, kind of AAA space games. Um, and so this this is a Nuclear Throne, um, which is kind of like a, an action roguelike dungeon crawler, I guess would be the way to describe it. Um, and so this this game is actually kind of notorious for for being a really juicy game, uh, sometimes to its detriment. Um, and so one of the things we haven't actually done much is obviously I've, I've said you know juiciness is great. Add it as much as you can to your experiences. Um, One of the things that can happen is obviously if you add too much, you can begin to detract from from the player experience. And you can actually, as Chris Chris was saying in in Super Mario Odyssey, potentially overwhelm the player with too many things that's happening. And then it's distracting them from the actual core game mechanics. Um, And so I think Nuclear Throne kind of blends this line quite well. Sometimes it does get a bit overwhelming. But typically, it's because your character has become so overpowered that it's not at a detriment to your experience. But it highlights that there is this kind of issue to consider of how much juiciness should you be adding. Um, so I'm interested. So think, how did yeah. the community respond to that? So, I mean, Flambeer, the developers of this game, are kind of you know 
well loved in the indie community and kind of considered one of the pioneers of, of juiciness um or at least modern juiciness in games um and so it's definitely you know it was received really well the game's commercially successful um and you know you, you see like the screen shake that's going on right now like there's quite excessive screen shake um and especially again as an observer it feels really excessive but as a player um after playing the game for a bit you begin to kind of ignore that screen shake right it goes back into the subconsciousness um and yeah it, it was received well um i know they end in that, that draws you in so sometimes if, if you have a, a lot of visual references or a lot of um, communication references you kind of have to shut the rest of the world out a little bit and to, to zone in and we see that a lot in so obviously my, my main research is into virtuality and we see that a lot with vr games if you have real world um say up sounds or something creeping into vr experience um that can be more distracting so actually kind of overwhelming the player with lots of stuff happening lots of auditory feedback lots of visual feedback um can actually help them focus on the game yep um and so that's a, a really interesting point and there's um there's actually a, a great study um where they they kind of basically uh analyzed um professional esports players brains whilst they're playing games um at a competitive level and that's exactly what they found was actually what they, they started to do is they they tuned out most of the feedback that the game was given the most of the the superfluous feedback was irrelevant to the game information they needed um and so they just ignored it basically and when asked about it they don't even realize it's there because they're so focused on the game critical aspects um and so yeah it's clear that players can do that um but i think that's you know, we only know that happens at high level and i'd be quite interested to see if that does happen at a lower level of gameplay um yeah I've, I've not actually talked about what nuclear throne does really well we've kind of just gone on a, a sidetrack of of too much juice um but yeah so you know nuclear throne is a, a great example of some of what we call the the classic juicy elements um and so the ones that you can see in most games um and so the first of those is this uh this kind of idea of screen shake uh, and we mentioned it a little bit you know in, in rocket league um but this game really you know, every every kind of bullet you fire shakes the screen a little bit um and if you know if you've got quite a quite a heavy firing gun quite a meaty gun the screen shakes more um and so that's really important because what that's what that's doing is conveying the weight of that player's actions so you saw this absolutely ridiculous screen shake there in fact but it it conveys the weight of that player's actions and the damage that that gun's gonna deal it conveys that to the player through that screen shake um oh yeah and there's a, an excellent comment uh to do with sleep function uh and adding a, a slight freeze um, and so when, when we get to the tips at the end of the session, that's one of my tips for the record. Uh, spoiler alert. Um, and so, yeah, in, in this game and in quite a lot of, um, like, juicy games, they use this feature. Oh, I say this feature. They, they normally program, like, um, a, a game element where whenever, like, a hit effect happens, um, they freeze the game ever so slightly for, like, a, a fraction of a second, you know, like, literally 0 0.1 milliseconds. Um, and what that does is the, the, the player doesn't, perceive that as a freeze um but what it does is it kind of it gives the game a little chance to really emphasize that that action's happened um and that that makes the action feel more weighty so you know when you when you're swinging you know a big bat here or when a, a gun's shooting and as that bullet connects freezes for a fraction of a second the player picks up that they've hit them but they don't pick up that it's actually slowed down um and yeah it's, it's a classic example that's used in a lot of games um, but I think it's it's hidden in most games that players don't actually perceive it's even happening. Um, and then yeah, the other aspect that Nuclear Throne does really well when it comes to juiciness is particle effects. And so obviously it has quite an excessive amount of particle effects going on at any one time. Um, but again, they're all kind of derived from whatever is currently happening in the game state. So, you know, when the player is firing lots of bullets or has a gun that fires really fast or hits an explosive barrel, there's loads of particle effects. But it's only happening when the game, you know, when, when there should be lots of particle effects. Um, it's not just happening for no reason. It happens because of because of a player's action. Um, but it definitely runs into the kind of flaw where if you're in a really dense room in Nuclear Throne um, and you're, you're shooting your gun, uh, particle effects can begin to occlude, you know, your player character. And that's when that juiciness becomes too much. Um, but I think, you know, Flying Beers... You know, definitely knows how to do juiciness and i think they probably did that on purpose um any any comments chris are you, you... No, no i mean this so i suppose with a game like this 
Um, again, that, that kind of overwhelming nature, I wonder whether that kind of in itself ties into the the experience because it is a, a dungeon crawler. You're in this kind of constrained environment. And I think exactly. sometimes when you try to create that kind of environment, you want to create this almost sense of... Um, Claustrophobia is the wrong word, but this this kind of closed in, really impactful, yeah, almost, almost like planned chaos, right? Yeah, concussive. Um, I'm not sure if um, if if anyone that's watching has played uh, this game called Enter the Gungeon, um, which is quite a similar kind of format game to this top down dungeon crawler. Uh, but again, really juicy. But they also really go in on that that planned chaos where you know, you walk into a room and everything kind of starts firing at you at once. It's very overwhelming. But you you soon learn how to react to that, and that's how you get better at the game. And you start feeling like you're progressing. And for me, the um, the absolute uh, people who wrote the book on that is Bomberman. <laughs> yes, indeed. Because... Yeah, Bomberman is one of those games that gets chaotic really quickly. Um, but as you get better at the game, you can read that chaos quicker, and then it's no longer chaotic, right? Interesting. Um, and so, yeah, I think. Again, one, one of my favorite juicy examples um, that I like to go to when talking about juiciness is Overwatch. Um, so Overwatch is a, a team-based competitive shooter made by Blizzard. Um, but it's, it's one of those games where, again, every single action um, has a lot of, of juice to it. And I mean, you can just see watching, especially as an observer. It, I'm, I'm, Chris might even uh, chime in here. It feels quite overwhelming. But I'm sure, Chris, if, if you've not played Overwatch much either, you're probably like, what, what the hell is even going on here? Um, but I think that's part of the charm of the game, and that once you do yeah. know what's going on, when you're actually playing it, all of those feedback elements are, are great because they're informing you more of the game for all these extra extra aspects. So Overwatch is the game that almost just put me off esports. Oh, really? Because, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I found watching Overwatch competitions... The way they were structured, the way th the camera was, was, you know, I mean, the, the way they were kind of being presented, the speed the camera was moving around, I was like, I can't, I've got no idea what's going on. Has somebody <laughs> just shot someone else? I've literally no idea. Yeah. And the 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 mix of the, the amount of feedback, like I said, I mean, I, I love Overwatch for the, um, I, I think the, 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 the gun mechanics and the amount of feedback you get for, um, that informs you of of kind of how to play as that character. Yeah, it almost kind of takes you on a journey. It kind of gives you feedback. To say right, this is good. This works really well. Do more yeah, of it. There's a lot of explicit feedback in the juiciness terms. Yeah, yeah, um, and I really like that. But I think that combined with the um, the kind of presentation style where you're you're jumping between camera angles, you know, sports presenting. For me, that was just such a roller coaster of visual imagery. I, 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 I can't watch. I, was like, I just can't watch this yeah. anymore. The esports e are dead. Overwatch has killed it, and um, <laughs> I, I still can't watch an oversports esport e e match yeah. at all. I, I, think, too um, much. I think that's actually quite a common thing. And while it's a bit of a tangent, I think the one of the barriers that esports still needs to overcome is actually making it accessible to spectators that haven't played the game. Because um, again, you know, anyone that's that's watching this and's played Overwatch, it doesn't feel particularly overwhelming too much. Um, but if if you haven't played Overwatch, then you really don't know what's going on, and all that jumping around gets uh, confusing very quickly. Um, but just just to kind of touch on a couple of the juicy aspects I like in Overwatch, um, one of them is the gun sway. Um, and so the, the the gun sway is kind of done differently in that it doesn't actually affect the the aiming. Like, so it doesn't affect your mechanical performance. The reticule is still where bullets are shot. Um, but, you know, you can see here when the player's um, aiming left and right, when they're moving their mouse around, the guns will tilt and just animate ever so slightly in that direction. Um, and it's, it's done really subtly, but it further kind of conveys, right, that this 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 um, this character exists in the world and they have, you know, they have weight and their actions actually have to be carried out. They're not some thing that can disobey physics and spin around really fast because it's showing those little animations. Um, I think that helps, again, kind of give that aesthetic feel of polish. Um, and, yeah, I think Overwatch is a, a really polished game because of little bits like that. One of, one of my favorite Hicks quotes, actually, is is um, what, when you said, I think it was one of the first kind of lectures we ever did together, and you were saying you, you can spot the default Unity walk cycle a mile <laughs> off, you know. And I it never really struck me until you said that, but those default walk cycles they have a very specific bounce they have very specific yeah. kind of cadence as you're walking um 
and since you've said that, you've you've broken so many games for me because I, you know, I just I spot that straight away. But I think that's what's really nice about Overwatch. Actually, all the walk cycles from the characters different. feel different, especially based on the the weight and the bulk of the character. It, you know, um, the heavier characters, you see their arms kind of bounce in a much yeah, more. They, they have a real rhythm. weight for every single step. They even actually have less step sounds based on distance traveled because you know they're bigger. They've got longer legs, um, and that kind of really, really subtle attention to detail. Is what kind of kind of carries that game in its term, you know, um, in the in the context of juiciness at least. Um, so I'm only going to linger on Hearthstone really quickly, just because there's a couple of bits I wanted to mention. Um, so in in Hearthstone, again, another game by, uh, made by Blizzard, they're really good at uh, making sure their games feel juicy and polished to play. Um, is this um, this like uh, find in a match ticker? Um, and so you know, it's a, a card game where you, you queue up for matches with other players. Um, and now typically most games just have you know like a little um like a timer that says you're going to find a match in x amount of you know seconds um what blizzard has is this really nice rolling ticker that has like these sparks coming off and it feels like it's physical it feels like it's um kind of like a slot machine in real life um and it just keeps ticking around until it actually finds a match and um, i think actually my video lags slightly here um but the the sound effect that's happening all this is really juicy to see and when it does hit on one, there's like some funny answers as well. And then actually it always says it's a worthy opponent. But that in itself is inherently juicy and satisfying to see happen. Um, I think it's the same with a lot of stuff in Hearthstone. Every action, again, feels really weighty and meaty. I'm saying even just when they pick the card here, like the particle effects change and it flips over. Um, and again, there's that really deep sound effect. Um, so one of the, the talks at last Enhancement Week was Oliver was talking about what what video game designers can learn from board games and we talked yeah. about this kind of um how some card games some board games kind of work well and actually i think games like uh like also if if you took the juiciness away it would suddenly feel like a very boring play experience it would be a really bland game uh, like because it would be, the, the be kind of simple right yeah yeah, it, it, it has, you know, it's a, a fairly basic kind of, not just a rock, paper, scissors, but kind of attack damage weakness system that works as a card game format. But in the digital space, they needed to make sure that physicality of of real, you know, um, board games came across. And yeah, they did that through a lot of juicy effects. Um, one that's not shown in this video is you can click on like the side aspects of the board um, and that gives the player some feedback. So like if you, if you click on this crystal here, it just wiggles. No, no gameplay event, no, no, you know, ramification on on the outcome of the experience. Um, but it just feels like that board now exists mm. in a in a space because you can interact with it. Because it's straight away you think, well, if this wiggles, what does everything else do? Exactly, it encourages like kind of exploring and playing. Um, again, really quickly, uh, just to cover this one's called Celeste. Um, and so again, this is back to more of an indie game, but again, a very commercially successful game. Um, and so this is just a little platform that's kind of room based. Um, but again, it has a lot of different juicy elements going on at any time. Um, one of the ones I want to highlight here, because we're going to come back to it um, in the tip section in a second, is this uh, squash and stretch. And so you'll see whenever the character jumps, the sprite is actually compressed based on which direction it's moving. So if it's moving horizontally, it gets squished a little bit in that direction. And if it's moving vertically, it gets squished in the other direction. Um, and that kind of just helps again to convey what's happening in the game it conveys that 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 avatar has some some grounding in the physical world that exists um but i'm not gonna linger on this one too long because i want to get onto our tips um but i'm gonna have to show this one because it's a, a great juicy game as uh, so this is thumper it's a rhythm game um now i'm sure most of you have seen rhythm games in the um you know, in, in games like guitar hero or dj hero or rock band um and they're okay like they're, they're definitely rhythm games, um, but they're kind of flat in that you have these these you know things that come down from above and you just strum and then you get a little bit of feedback when you hit it. Um, and it's kind of, it's an abstract version of, of playing notes on, on a, a song, right? Um, where, where Thumper, still a rhythm game, still kind of the core mechanics and player skill of pressing a button at the right time. But if you look at the amount of feedback that's happening here and it's not just notes coming at you, they're grounded in the game world and then when, when you hit, hit them, you still get all that nice feedback and that meatiness. Um, and again, this is one of my favorite rhythm games to play because it's so juicy. And it's 
um, to use the word again, we've kind of overused it today, but it's really visceral just to have that experience. Um, and yeah, I find myself just trying to play Fumba for like 10 minutes and then I've played it for like an hour without realizing um, because it keeps you immersed in that kind of visceral gameplay loop of pressing the buttons at the right time. Uh, and I think I got one more example before we get into the tips. Yeah. Uh, and so lastly, we've got Tetris Effect. Um, again, Tetris, really old game. I think most people have probably played it. If they haven't played it, they've definitely heard the, the rapid theme song that plays in Tetris that gets faster as uh, the game goes on, which is a great bit of juicy feedback for the record. Um, but in, in the more modern Tetris and Tetris Effect, as you can see right here, there is a ton of particle effects happening every time the player moves a piece, places a piece, does anything in the game. The game chucks as much feedback as is reasonable at the player. And so they're not overwhelming the player here because they, they don't want to occlude any of the game board for too long because, it's again, it's quite important to be able to read the state of the Tetris game board to know where to put your places. Uh, sorry, to put your pieces. Um, but yeah, again, it's just a, a great example of just little bits of juice applied very effectively to help make that quite polished experience. Um, and there's some great little sound aspects. I don't know if they're coming through because they're quite quiet. But each time you move the piece, there's a little beep. But like it kind of, again, it's in tune with the music in the background. So it almost helps form part of the soundtrack through through you moving your piece. Um, yeah, I really like that. Um, so what I want to make sure I cover um, is the, the five tips, right, to, to take away. Uh, so this one was yeah, already mentioned in the chat. Uh, and that's this idea of a freeze frame. Um, and again, Smash Brothers does this to a, a perfect degree, where you know when, when the player lands a, uh, a big hit that's going to be a knockout, it zooms in and it, it freezes on the action um, and lingers. Um, and then, and then you know, the rest of the event happens, so it has that freeze frame. Um, it's seen in a lot of games. It's relatively cheap to implement, right? Um, you have to go careful that you don't make it freeze too long, otherwise, what you do is you stop it from being a really impactful event and you turn it into a really sluggish event um, where you then feel like the game isn't responding to you because it's freezing so much and then your input's not being registered. So, um, so it has to be this to me, like the freeze events of a bit like um, if anyone's ever you know been, been in uh, a situation where it feels like time has slowed down. I, I, um, if, you, if you've ever been like in a boxing match or, or got in a fight or, or something like that and you see a something a punch coming at your face it feels like time <laughs> is slowing down for a second um people often describe it you know if, if um uh if they've had a near miss in a car you know stuff like that and so we describe those freeze events it makes it feel more impactful because it's almost forcing that sense of time dilation exactly. on you yeah it's entirely the the, the point around that freeze frame is to add impact to the player's actions and, you know, if we go back to the kind of definition of, of juiciness, what that's doing is it's making it really explicit and confirmatory that you've done a good action, right? Because it's it's frozen and it's lingered on it for just long enough for you to go, hell yeah, I've killed this enemy or I've, I've done the correct thing. Um, and again, relatively easy to add to your game. Um, the next tip, squash and stretch. Um, so I didn't mention actually in Celeste's, so squash and stretch um, actually comes from, from the animation principles. And so there's there's kind of um, you know animators are taught these these twelve principles of animation, um, and a lot of them like uh, deal with making sure your animation um, feels alive and looks like it's grounded in whatever the reality of your world is. Uh, and so squash of, squash and stretch is kind of an extension of that. And that you know if an object moves, it must kind of you know if it's moving with force, that force has to be applied to that object in some way, so it's making it believable. Um, and so again, squashing and stretching sprites or models is a relatively cheap thing to do. You can kind of add a quick script, you know, in Unity, for example, that based on the velocity of an object, the X and Y scales are squashed. Um, yeah, it can literally be done in like 10 minutes, and that instantly has an effect in that now, whenever you move your character, when any objects move in your game, they feel a bit more like they're grounded in that world and there's weight to them when they move. Um, I'm not sure how this one's gonna appear on the stream. Um, so, so this is particle effects. Um, so for anyone that kind of knows how, how videos are encoded, um, particle effects uh, are known for kind of breaking um, the like YouTube streamer, um, I can't remember what it's called now, the compression algorithm, um, because particle effects are all over the screen and that makes it really hard. So hopefully it looks okay. Um, but so particle effects, again, is quite a cheap thing to add. 
um, in that you can chuck them onto any of the kind of game events that make sense to have those particle effects. Um, and that, again, helps make the player feel like they're awesome, right? So, you know, when you hit a player in God of War, for example, and all these particle effects erupt out of the enemy when they die, that feels good. You know, and again, it comes back to that idea that Chris was mentioned. It, um, it makes it feel more impactful. Um, yeah, God of War does this really well. Um, but there's plenty of games, you know, there's particle effects in most games now. Most game engines off the shelf have some way of adding particle systems. So it can be done really cheaply. Um, and what have we got? Screen shake. Um, and this has come up, and I think, in most of the examples we've been talking about. Um, screen shake is kind of the, the OG of, of juicy effects. Um, it's one that most people say, oh, yeah, just add some screen shake to your, your game. It will feel better. Um, and that's probably, you know, it does. You know, a small bit of screen shake goes a long way. Um, what I will say is what we've found, um, both from kind of the research I've done on juiciness, but also the industry as a whole, um, is that screen shake actually can have some negative impacts on the experience. And it can I was be about disorienting. To say, it, it, it seems to be a very split opinion through players whether they like, I mean, I, I know some games now you have the option to turn the screen shake off. Yeah, and that's exactly what I was going to say is if you do add screen shake, make sure you include some way to turn that off. Um, because, yeah, some players, it can be really disorientating. It can cause motion sickness and all kinds of other issues. Um, so, again, add it so that you have it there for if people want to feel that visceral, you know, world-shaking event and impact, they can. But also, you know, include a way to turn it off. Um, and potentially, you know, um, so games like Rocket League, for most of their juicy elements now, you can actually turn them off um, for all kinds of different reasons, right? Some people just don't like those aspects of the experience. Um, and so consider that if you are actually implementing any of these tips, make them optional so that players can have that control over their experience. I suppose graphic engines as well. You know, you were talking about how um, thing video gets encoded. Sometimes you can actually get a better streaming experience by reducing the amount of yeah cool visual elements. You get a more better visual experience. Um, and then the the last tip, and this is almost I guess, kind of the most ambiguous tip because there's not like the, the other four tips are really clear. Like add this to your game, it's you know clear how to implement. Um, but this one is this idea of superfluous feedback. Uh, and so I've included actually a little clip of the remake of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater here uh, because it does actually a really good job of just adding lots of feedback for a, a single game event. Um, and that's that's what you should be trying to do. So if you if kind of you know if you're making a game, um, you know play it. Consider, you know, if, say, your character can shoot in the game, you know, press that shoot button and see how you convey in that you've uh, fired a bullet to the player. And then how else can you convey that, right? Is there a sound effect? Is there a particle effect? Is there a bit of screen shake? Like, all those different, you know, extra layers of feedback and the, the multimodal, like, what different channels can you put feedback on? Can it be visual? Can it be audio? Um, can you use haptics if you're using a game controller? Like, all that kind of stuff should be considered. Um, and yeah, Tony Ox does this exactly right there. Like when you're grinding, the controller vibrates, the sound changes, you have that nice kind of like great in sound, but it's a satisfying great. Um, when you land, they play like a nice satisfying audio effect to say you've landed that trick successfully. You get the score come up, that's some explicit feedback. But all of this is arguably superfluous to the game, right? You can do all that stuff. You, know, you can play the game without that and it would work. It functions Tony Hawk, but it wouldn't be as fun. <laughs> So you, you mentioned about the controller shaking there. Mm -hmm. So are haptics, is that part of juiciness? Yeah, it can be part of juiciness. Um, so interestingly, um, if, if we go back to that definition that I uh, showed at the very beginning of this talk, um, when we interviewed designers, uh, no one ever mentioned haptic feedback, um, which was curious to us because, again, when I think about my, my play experience, um, I think about how controllers vibrate for different game actions and how that's actually quite important to what's happening. Um, and it definitely is, you know, just because the designers didn't necessarily recall it in those interviews, it definitely is something that's important. And I think it fits into that idea of this, this multimodal feedback or superfluous feedback. So again, it's just another channel that you can use as a, as, as a developer to communicate the impact of players' actions or to confirm players' actions or to explicitly say to the player what's happening, but just with another another feedback mode. And with that considered then, would you say that juiciness can help games be more accessible? Because I, I, mean, I know some players who have certain um, visual or auditory um, differences um, who 
use the other feedback channels to better understand the game. So I, I know one person who is very reliant on haptic feedback um, for how they, they experience their games. I know one person who um, uses a lot of audio cues and biases towards games that have really strong audio cues. Yeah. Um, and yeah, 100%. Um, like through through adding that multimodal feedback to every game event, so that's what a, a juicy game should have, right? Um, that allows players um, that are more reliant on maybe a particular mode of feedback to still get enough information. Um, so obviously I use this kind of phrase of superfluous feedback. So, you know, it's it's feedback that doesn't convey new knowledge. Um, but if, if the player's... Um, unable to receive the feedback on a different layer. So if they're unable to see the visual feedback um, for, for a variety of different reasons, the fact that there is feedback that vibrates and there is feedback that's audio allows them to still play the game and to gather that information. Um, and there's some really great examples of, you know, some players taking this to to the, the kind of pinnacle of this. And so I've seen um, someone play Zelda Ocarina of Time um, with no visual feedback at all. They played it um, Whilst blind and just use the audio and haptic feedbacks that that game gave um, to play through the entire game. Because again, as I said, Nintendo is really good at keeping that kind of juiciness and aesthetic polish throughout their experiences. And in that instance, because they did that, the game was able to be played by someone that did have a vision impairment. I say, I mean, I mean, you, you don't need to be at the extreme levels of that spectrum there as well. You don't need to be fully, you know, no, no, blind or deaf. But if you you have a um, some sort of hearing challenge or I mean, like I said, I've known some games that I've done. I've got a friend who's who's deaf in one ear, and some games use uh, stereo sweeping effects, and they really struggle because I'll hear that through the headphones through one ear, but not the other. Yeah, and I think that's when you know, if you look at uh, games like Overwatch that I said, and you know, I praise for their juiciness, they they tackle that actually because there's a visual feedback that happens. So when you're shot on the left hand side, there's a, an indicator that you've been shot on the left hand side, in addition to the stereo sound. So yeah, if someone is um, more reliant on the visual feedback, those those juicy aspects can convey that information. Um, there's so um, I think that's a, a really interesting future area of research as well. There's a really interesting comment in the chat actually, and I think this this probably ties into that that area of research. Um, as PC gaming increases in popularity, do you think those designers may have perhaps looked overlooked haptic as a component of juiciness, as it is difficult to implement without additional hardware? Yes, I think that's that's an absolutely fantastic question. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's potentially one of the reasons um, that maybe designers in the PC space um, aren't considering haptic feedback as much as they are visual and audio. Um, but I, I think we might see that change look into the future where we see, um, again, both, both Nintendo and Sony have released kind of more advanced haptic feedback controllers in this kind uh, this current cycle of uh, consoles. So both the Nintendo Switch and the PS5 have extra hap haptic feedback, and I think through them doing it, that that will probably pave the way for PC to start doing something similar. Whether that's you know a company like Steam releasing another controller, or just players wanting to use PS5 controllers or Switch controllers in their games, and that might again hopefully encourage PC developers to start using haptic feedback. Because um, currently we're using it, um, or game designers are using it in quite a shallow manner, and that it's just you know vibrate when you need to give feedback. But there's the I potential suppose, for really rich PC, feedback. I suppose PC designers as well. I mean, when I've worked in that design space, you tend to work from keyboard first and move outward from there. And I'm yet to see a haptic keyboard, which is surprising actually, because yeah. I can think of it. I mean, you get haptic feedback through the action of pressing a key. Yeah. Um, but I'm surprised there hasn't been more like vibration. Mm. You'd think you'd be able to do that quite quite effectively. Yeah, and maybe, maybe we'll see that. If um, so, the the PlayStation Five controller for those that might not be aware, the the triggers are actually have haptic feedback in them now. So so the triggers provide a level of resistance based on whatever the kind of in game event that makes sense. Um, and so you could see quite easily how that kind of haptic trigger could be applied to a keyboard, and you had haptic keys. Um, I think we're looking into the far future at that point, but I'd like to see stuff like that make its way to PC games. I'd love to see a mechanical keyboard where I could vary the amount of resistance. Exactly, right? And that's that's exactly how the, the PS5 triggers work. Um, but yeah, that's that's the last tip. Um, and that's, that's basically everything I did want to cover in this talk today. Uh, I don't know if there's any more questions um, in the chat. Um, there haven't been any more, um, 
But uh, absolutely fan- thanks for that, Kieran. That was that was really yeah, awesome. Good. I always like talking about juiciness. It's something I'm passionate about. Really well. Thank you to everyone for coming along. Just as a reminder, that we've got uh, Jim Bennett from Microsoft who's doing a talk um, at uh, six pm UK time. Um, so again, uh, thanks, Kieran, and um, enjoy the rest of Enhancement Week. See you later, everyone. Thanks again. <laughs>